What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of the Millionaires to Billionaires podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, we bring you guys amazing conversations with amazing entrepreneurs from all over the world. And we dive a little bit deeper into their story to get some skills, some resources, some strategies, anything to help you in your journey. So that way you can apply it today. We're joined by Sarah today with Contivo. So I'm excited to dive into her story and uh, see how her journey started. So how, you know, welcome to the show. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. So where did my journey start? Oh gosh, from an yeah. entrepreneurial standpoint? You know what, we could we could go straight, uh, how was childhood like, you know, huh. b before the entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I had, a, I had a really unique childhood. Um, I'm the youngest of six, was raised on a small farm. And uh, all girls, boys, how many? I, I'm the, there's the oldest, the boy. Okay. So it's five girls, one boy. Damn, oldest okay. is his brother, I know. Five and boys. we were raised by a single mom, so it was God, wow. God bless his soul, all women. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I had a, I'm the youngest of six. Very untraditional for, you know, normal standards. Um, I was raised on a farm. We were homeschooled my whole life, uh, with the exception of two years. I went to a Baptist school for two years. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> How was being homeschooled? Looking back at it now, like I think it was amazing. Um, as far as the opportunities and the skill sets that it developed in me uh, and even my sibling group, that would not have occurred had we not been homeschooled. My, had I not been homeschooled, so like your whole life too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to college and I got and I moved on and ended up getting two bachelor's degrees in marketing and business, and then have a, a master's degree. So no in grade business. school, no high school, yeah. no experiences of that. Or any of that's that overrated. Yeah. I'm going to argue that that's well, overrated. That's what I, I just yeah. want to ask because yeah, right now, no. like, um, I've had a full time job since I was 12. Okay. So I was exposed to peers, uh, you know, of my age in, I always worked in restaurants or bars and right. things like that. Um, so I did, I think about 15 years old, I had a, a core group, a um, couple friends and those that I had met in the restaurant industry when I was working. So, you know, I was exposed to things, um, exposed to peer groups by all means. But well, um, I always ask because my daughter, obviously, that's one of the biggest things and in today's world, like more now that now knowing what I know in our education system, that's what's big for me. And I literally was just talking about last night and I look at my fiance and I'm just like, I, I don't even want to put her in our normal traditional you, schools. Like I want to, I want to homeschool her. If you her. can homeschool her, I would hands down recommend it all mm -hmm. day, especially now. Like it's even it's a hundred times worse now than when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties. Um, my sister homeschools her kids and they are incredible, not, not just incredibly smart, but they they have, there's no socialization. Well, it's only it's only what you put into them is what they get. Like, that's the thing. Like, you don't know what's being put in those brains when you're at yeah. When you're well, here's the, the stereotype that people have is if you're homeschooled, you're going to be awkward and don't have the social right. skills and all of that. Here's my theory on that, and from what I've found, you're either weird or you're not weird. Homeschooling is not a factor in the matter. So right. same with your parents. Like if your parents were weird and they homeschooled you because they were weird, you're going to be weird. It's not because you're homeschooled. See, if I your parents you. are cool and you homeschool your kids, you're going to you're gonna have cool kids. Well, see where I feel like it is because you see how much stuff we do. Like we're, I travel like all the time, like out, out, mm -hmm. of, out of the States. Like, so I travel a lot. I go to events a lot. My, we have a big family. So we're doing stuff all the time. And I'm like, me homeschooling my, 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 uh, my daughter and everything. I'm the like, exposure. you ain't going to miss out nothing. Like, we're going to, she's going to be at all of our events when we're when I'm on stage, she's when we're at all these, like she's going to have more yes. friends and, and probably a lot and better And she's going to have a better socialization would. skills because she's going to be exposed to adults that have good characters and good yeah. socialization skills. That's the stuff you want her to absorb. But I don't care if she's two years old or 12 years old, you expose her to other two year olds. She's going to be a little snot nosed brat running around. Like you're not exposed. Well, and that's her where to I'm at things. with it. And I'm like, that's what I'm leaning towards. So I just wanted to, to kind of ask and see no, what it is. Absolutely. You brought that up and we're sitting in front of someone and I'll be honest with you. Obviously I would never, you're not weird to me at all. So right. I mean, people are shocked that I was homeschooled because then I did still go on yeah. to traditional college and got a master's degree. And even in, in my master's program, people were, again, there's the stereotype that you're weird. And I have, I get it because I was exposed to a lot of the really weird homeschoolers growing up. It was like, uh, did you ever ask your parents why they chose to homeschool? Uh, my mom, yeah, it was a quality of education. Ah, you know, makes sense. Yep. same thing. It was like my mom had this big focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic, and it was always like if you nailed those three things, there wasn't anything you couldn't succeed at in life. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And those, I think, are the three very things that the, the public school system for sure. My only that. thing is, I got to say, because your mom was a single mom, how did she homeschool six kids and to go and be able to and then provide <laughs> that, you all that stuff? Yeah, so <laughs> like. that kind of goes to the other skill sets we learned. Um, 
she was incredibly savvy at making, finding ways to make money. Mm -hmm. So awesome. there was like a whole variety of ways. It's like we had, um, she'd raise like two to three steer cattle a year. Um, or actually I should say more than a year. It's like two to three years before she, before they'd get butchered. But, um, that meat she'd sell. So it's like, we'd always keep a portion of it for our own eating. And then she'd sell the rest of it to different people in the community that would want it. That's not like big money, but it was enough to support things. Um, she was also really, really good with like finding junk, refurbishing it and reselling it. Now no, it's a thing. Everybody's doing that. Yeah. Everybody. Awesome. Oh yeah. Everybody's doing that now. But like when I was a kid, no one was doing it. In fact, I thought it was embarrassing as shit. I'm like, you're, we're picking this up on the side of the road and then we're going, you're going to refinish it. And then someone's going to come to the house from a classifieds ad and buy it from <laughs> us. Like it was embarrassing. Um, but now it's like, oh, it's, it's so it's commonplace, norm. but it was mm -hmm. not the norm then. So she was <laughs> definitely ahead of the curve of how to make money. Um, one of the other things I remember I was so embarrassed by is like our, we had a neighbor who had this big, huge barn and they had an auction and it was like auctioning off different equipment that was in the barn and all this different stuff. And there was, do you know what the size of a hay wagon is like? Yeah. It, it's, yes. it's big. Like massively huge. It's massively yes. huge. At the end of the auction, everything that didn't sell just got put onto this hay wagon. And it's like overflowing with yeah. what I would have called as a child shit. Um, no one wanted it. So she bought the whole wagon of stuff for $2. That's what it went for. And I remember like having to wheel this thing into our front yard. And I'm like, this is embarrassing. We're like the junk house. And she's like, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And <laughs> it eventually got moved into our garage. We had a huge garage. But um. Over time, I mean, she made a killing on that. The stuff, like the good little gems she found in there, See, her man. two dollar investment turned into a lot, and that was just I that was know. how we made it growing up. It was like it was we never had more than what we needed, but all of our food was raised on the farm, so it wasn't like we were grocery shopping. It was ninety percent of everything we ate was was home raised. Um, we had a well, he we burned, we heated the house with wood. So mm -hmm. that we'd also like if there was a fallen down tree, and, we and got the call. And we where really was this at? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. I was born and raised in Wisconsin. Um, so as long as we always had enough wood to get through the winter, we were fine. Every now and then she'd have to fill the propane tank. And that was like, okay, where are we going to get the money mm -hmm. to do this? And she'd find <laughs> something to sell. <laughs> yeah. So one thing I noticed, because you say everything was home, home, you know, fed and stuff yeah. like that, grown and fed, that plot probably played a role in your healthy lifestyle. And For stuff. sure. So For one sure. thing I've noticed, you posted something a couple of days ago. You've always looked like this, you know, <laughs> since you were 15 years old. <laughs> well, actually, since if we go back even younger, if you look at like photos of me when I'm like six, I yeah. had shoulders and biceps at like six years old. Yeah. And now I now I know why as a kid, people are like mistaken me as a boy all the time because my mom always kept her hair short. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, shit. Like, I so did the, did the farm <laughs> do that to you because For being sure. out there? Yeah. Since I can remember... I was working like yeah. it was working. Um, I always we always had our own horses and mm -hmm. mine started with a pony as a as a young kid. But we didn't have because it was too expensive. The heaters that you'd put in your water tanks to keep the water un, uh, unfrozen throughout yeah. the, the winter. So we had to always bring out a hot bucket of water, several hot buckets of water every day in the winter to melt the ice. And so mm -hmm. the horses could drink. Well, the only hot water source we had was in the basement. So we had to start yeah. in the basement okay. with like the five gallon buckets, fill it up with hot water, lug it up the stairs, put it on a sled and then bring it out to the horse pasture, which is like, it's a long trek. Yeah. Um, but I know I was pretty young doing this cause I'm so little, I'm carrying the same one with like two hands and I'm like one step at a time all the way up. Yeah. You, the you've been building since you were young. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I appreciate, you know, like as a kid, I thought it was just. Like, man, why is our life so much harder than everyone around me? Because it was compared to, like, my peers that had two-parent homes that were both working and, and all of that. But now, looking at where I'm at and looking at where my peers are at that didn't have that same kind of struggle, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I don't know how to fly not, that in here. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Um, oh, I wouldn't. Well, doors open. wouldn't take it back. Well, I, 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 it, we kind of have something similar because mine, how I grew up the same way. Like, my dad was always working two to three jobs trying to keep a roof over our head. Um, parents split up at a young age and um, there was three of us boys so my dad was always working so I was taking care of my my two younger brothers okay. so I had to like grow up at a young age right away and then not only that 
I wanted things like I wanted a new bike. I wanted a skateboard. All my friends had it. And then my cousin, he was a single child and he always got all this new stuff. So, um, I would go to my dad and ask, and he's like, son, I, I can't afford, I can't do that. But one thing my dad did was he taught me how to go make money. So I was literally, I, I could like from probably like eight years old, I started, I was either like knocking on doors, washing cars out front. I was mowing lawns. My dad would take the lawnmower and all that stuff. I was doing that. I started spray painting, um, the addresses on the curbs to make money. Yes. So like a lot of those things that I see in you, and but that is what made me the hustler, the man I it am. It was the same. And the character, but you, we all looked, I could feel you because I was like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm that, like like that kid's like, we don't really got money, we're the poor family, yeah. we're this and everything, right. but all the stuff, how people looked at you, but what that did and how we grew up is what made us who we are today. And now we're thankful for it looking back because I tell my dad all the time, I'm like, man, thank you, you so much. You Pops. could like, take everything I have away from me and I'm not gonna <laughs> say I wouldn't give a shit, but it's like, I'd get it back. What, I get it back, yeah. which is Amen why right there with you. I'm very risk adverse when it comes to how I invest my money. And it's because I'm like, it's just money. I'll get yeah. more. It'll come back to me. Um, but I have had a job. I, and I was babysitting, God, every weekend, probably like Thursday through Sunday since I was like 10 years old because it was like I wanted money. Our mom. See, damn, I was the same way. Yeah, yeah. it's like we didn't have, if we wanted anything past a roof over our head and food on the table. We had and, to go get it. And hand me down yeah. clothes. Um, I had to get it. Yeah. And I always wanted nice things and, you know, I found a way to get it, but it was always working, um, finding ways to work. And then I had a, before, I think it's like 14, it's like shit, 16 here. Now I think I have a W2, you know, earning job, but it was 12 yeah. where I was raised and I was, I was in demand even at, with like local employers. Cause I hustled and I was like, I, I want money, yeah. <laughs> I want money to buy things. Yeah, um, that's how it was. The only time I ever got anything was the start of a new school year, Christmas or my birthday. So I knew that those yeah. were the only times I was going to get anything new. Outside of that, I wasn't getting anything. Yeah. I had to go get it on yeah. my own. So, And well, again, I I totally appreciate that now. Yeah, I, I do too. Yeah. What, uh, what was your first, uh, what was your like first business or your first startup of anything on your own? If and when and how old were you? <laughs> you want to start with childhood? <laughs> yeah, probably. I guess it was all so, that, huh? Um, I mean, I look back, it started little, I was probably like five or six years old. One, my mom got this again, probably at an auction. It was like the most random thing, like the little cardboard boxes that are like the movie theater popcorn boxes. Yeah. We had a whole bunch of them. I don't know where they came from, but I was like, we, to make popcorn, we didn't have a microwave. My mom didn't believe in those <laughs> either. <laughs> so to make popcorn, you had to use like the old kettle skillet. Yeah. And none of my siblings ever wanted to do the work of making the popcorn. So I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make all this popcorn in advance and then I'm going to sell it to them because I'm going to do the work. So I'm making popcorn and then like filling these popcorn things. And I remember like lining them up on the uh, countertop in the kitchen and like standing in front of it. And I had like price points on each of it. And selling popcorn. That's, that's where it started. Awesome. Selling popcorn to my siblings. Um, I was very, uh, I was young, so I wasn't good at pricing. And I remember I thought a nickel was more than a dime. So I had the larger sized popcorn for a nickel, nickel and the smaller one that's for the awesome. dime because I looked at it as a size. And I remember my siblings being like, giving me shit. And they're like, so this one's a nickel. And I didn't understand. I'm like, yes, that one's more. Um, <laughs> like, oh, so all right. <laughs> I, I probably didn't make as much as I could have, but... I did sell popcorn. I did that. I remember doing that several times. It was like any time um, they didn't want to make it, I'd just go make popcorn and sell that to my siblings. And then um, then past that, I was really crafty all the time. So I could make like things out of wood. We had a wood shop in our basement. And I made some like these cool Christmas Santa Claus things. And uh, that was where my mom was very encouraging. I was like, hey, if you make a bunch of them, you can sell them at the local like flea market thing. And I yeah. remember doing that. So I was always making something and selling something. Um, and then as I got older, you know, in my first real business business, like yeah. past that was uh, 2000, I would have been like 26. And I had a, with my ex-husband at the time, we opened a like 6,500 square foot personal training center. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of. And how was that? So obviously now you're like getting into it, which that obviously and says you got to, you got to buy the building or get a lease. You have signed it for two to four years, anywhere six like years. that. Six years. <laughs> so yours did a six, six year. Years. I know mine's like, I did a four in year. In 2008, right when the market, right when the whole world was like going to shit and everyone's like, you're starting a personal training center in yeah. 2008. But yeah, how was that experience? Uh, there's two sides of it. Would I ever run a business with a spouse again? Never. Um, 
at least, you know, my personal experience of what I was married to. But uh, the experience that I have gotten from the lease, you know, you're signing into a lease. There's a whole education process there. I now know what not to, what to look for. Right. So you're not screwed over as a tenant as well, or at least from a fair, fair terms. Um, mm-hmm. We had payroll of up to 10 at any one time, you know, whether it was full-time employees or contractors, um, the payroll, you know, there, there's a lot learned in running payroll, making sure your employees are going to get paid. You might not get paid for months on end, you know, especially in the beginning, um, but you're, yep. you're having to still hustle to make sure they get paid. That's an experience. Um, customer, yeah, there's, there's so Share with many. us your top three, like, lessons that you learned in that business and starting it then. If you were to narrow it down to like, what would be your top three lessons that you learn in a traditional business, starting a gym and opening? Because uh, some we could also resonate on is I, I'm right there with you. I've started opened up my own gym. I just had a four year lease on it, uh, sixty seven hundred a month, and every year it went up a little bit, uh, a certain percentage. So I know what it's like. And then my time hit. I was one year in, and then boom, COVID hit. So in my experience of mine was when COVID hits, it shuts down. I get two months of just basically like my landlord says, hey, two months, you don't got to pay anything. And on the third month, she's like, um, I want my money. And I'm like, well, my yeah. business still ain't open. And don't you see what's going on? And she's like, I don't care. Don't. And I had to make a no. pivot. And I had to, find, I had to yeah. find someone to find and take over my current lease that I had so I can get out of it clean and clear and not have to file either bankruptcy or yeah, let it hit my credit and owe them over $275,000 for what the rest of the three years would be yeah. at 6700 a month. So, And then payroll and all that. So some of the biggest lessons I've learned yeah. is just – really is, is cash flow, <laughs> yeah. cash flow. And then also just really looking and understanding what it's going to be. And then is it your really true passion and love for what you want to do? Yeah. I think the number one thing I learned from that experience is throw your business plan aside. Cause it doesn't mean shit. And Cause it's like, you can put all this fancy like budget on paper and what your projected revenue is going to be. Map, but it literally yeah. is means nothing. Because your focus and my, like, the focus, focus really needs to be one thing and one thing only. How are you going to get sales? Because the rest of it, that goes to your cash flow statement. It's like the rest That's of what it, it doesn't really mean shit. Um, the number of thing, you know, I think that the main thing learned in all of that, though, is whatever you think something is going to cost you to get it off the ground or to even keep maintain it, at least double it. At least double it. I'll agree with you. At least, at least. double it. That's the minimum. So, at the minimum. <laughs> at the and, minimum. and that's still all things going as planned or, you know, without any catastrophic scenarios in there. Double it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, that's one piece of it. Uh, the, you're, you better have a high tolerance for stress because the burden that comes with payroll is it, it's not the same as just worrying about how you're going to get your own bills paid. You're now responsible for the lives of X number of individuals and their families, potentially, if they have families. So you're going to, you're not going to be sleeping, especially Mm -hmm. if you're running, if you have cash flow, you know, scenarios. Um, So (laughs) you might be taking out another loan just to make your payroll. Um, And you can't even, at least I'm a very, I don't don't share that kind of stuff with employees. So it was like, I just, everyone's getting paid, you know, and you carry that burden and and that stress. Um, those are those are the two biggest ones. And then the third one is I don't care what business you go into. If you don't think that your primary job is going to now be sales and marketing, don't go into it. Personal training, whatever. You know, like everyone goes into something, oh, I'm going to be a personal trainer. I'm going to do this full time. No, you're going to be a trainer part time. You're going to be sales and marketing full time. Yes. If you're doing this for yourself. People don't understand that. And that's everything. Like whether you're an e-commerce store it's or our business, a podcast or it, whatever. Sales and marketing. And that's something I didn't learn until... I was already like feed in all the way in first. <laughs> so how long did that go for? You did a six year lease. Did you fulfill we did a full six years? Um, we got out right, right before six years was up. Cause that's when I came back to Arizona. Okay. But they got, they had another tenant that wanted the building. So it was, so it was easy to yeah. transition out. Yeah. I think whenever uh, you're building a business or just from our uh, core background and stuff, growing up, not having everything, but just having enough, the roof over your head, the food on the table and nothing beyond that is, Within that background, it allows us to adapt to stress a lot easier. Oh, that I can handle stress like a lot, a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I've had stressful corporate positions, yeah. and 
I remember that was one of the things leadership would comment and other people was like, oh, how are you handling all the stress? I'm like, this is not stressful. This is, not, <laughs> like, this well, is, this is nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because my sales team, some of these guys, they stress about some things and they go to tell me what it is. I'm like, well, what's going on? And it says, and I'm like, bro, only if you fucking knew, man. Yeah. I got guys that'll come here, it, man, and, and they, they, they have one collection and they're stressing about it. And I was like, man, when I started sales, I had to pivot and go back to door-to-door -door sales. I've been doing it for years. Um, I'd say about eight years going on nine, but... I did door-to-door -door sales and then had to, I hopped out of it, went on my journey, and then hopped back into it. I had to pivot because that was the only thing I know I could make money right away, get it, and get back yep. on my toes. So it's like crazy because when I had to get back into it, just think about going door-to-door -door sales and I'm losing a, I'm losing three businesses. I'm getting eviction notices. My truck's being repossessed. Phone's being turned off. Investors are calling me and I could keep going. And then people yep. I'm like, so that's how I had to figure out to sell, do this while with mm -hmm. all that going on. So to stress and what you got going on, that's, that's, that's nothing to me. Buddy. Yeah. I'm just saying, hey, like, I think you're right. It <laughs> probably does start with the way we were raised. It was like, yeah. um, it was working from day one. And if you want more, you're going to you find mm -hmm. ways. And then I, and I have another, you know, there's like there's a few more elements I add to it. It's like, you have that, those experiences growing up. Um, mm -hmm. I raised three kids and it's like parenting is also a whole different level of stress. So it's like yes. this, the rest of this shit, this isn't even as stressful as thinking about raising your yeah. kids. So it was like you, you combine those and then it's like when you get outside the home, I'm like, oh, this is freeing feeling yeah. um, in its own mm -hmm. way. But you have to, I think there is a threat, there is a tolerance that you learn to just adapt to stress and pressure. I agree. Yeah. Well, that stress level does adjust because what someone like us, we yeah. consider stress is not even, it doesn't even, yeah. you know, tip the needle a little bit compared to somebody else's stress for sure. So I agree. Um, I did want to dive into a little bit of your, the health and fitness side, getting into Contivo now, which is your current business. What, uh, why Contivo, why um, that journey? And what did you see that you had to provide value to for that industry? Um, so it kind of started it started small and has evolved on it kind of unintentionally. Um, it started as a need. So I was, Contivo is a large insulated lunch bags, just for a little bit of background. Um, my health and fitness background and just the way I t try to take care of myself, I've always brought my own food with me everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Lunch, you know, eat out as minimal as possible. And there was a, the bags that were in the marketplace are just lacking in terms of size and or if they have size, they they don't have style. Um, they're very masculine, cooler kind of style. Yep. Um, cooler bag type look. So I made one, I made a line. I was like, you know, maybe I can make a better lunch bag and market them. And it was done while I was still working full time. Um, I did... Three different, three different styles initially. One, two were small, one was big, and it ended up being accidentally that the big one is the one that sold out. Mm -hmm. So I made some, you know, pivoted and made some changes within the business in 2021 and focused solely on this large bag, which is kind of a niche market, um, and ran with it that way. Where I, I, I've always liked entrepreneurial I, that's always been my preference over working for someone. I can do really well working for someone, but I, I like the, f the flexibility that comes right. with entrepreneurism. Um, I always wanted a, if I was going to do it again, you know, from the gym experience, it was going to be a consumer-based product. I wanted a product, um, something you could scale at a, a, in a way different than the size of your building. Right. Um, so it just seemed to be a good fit to where it's like, okay, I feel there's a need for this. I can do it because I live this lifestyle and it fit within the desire to have a consumer based, um, tangible product, I should say, yeah. where to scale it, it's like, instead of making a thousand, we're going to make 10,000. Um, when would you, when did you start that company? 2020. 2020. 2020. And you were making it, so you, you were meal prepping. You said you always meal prepped. You always brought your meals with you. That's because you're always on the go, you know, just always, always on, on the, go. the go. And then I had a, I, I, I've bodybuilded since I was 15. I yeah. have only competed twice, though. Um, but I've just lived a generally healthy lifestyle. I mean, going back to childhood. So that's the way you were raised. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I uh, notice in entrepreneurs, in myself, in, in our journey, and just in other people's journey that I see, like, they find success. And you find your most success in some of your biggest pains. Mm -hmm. And 
then or like your purpose, I should say, comes from a lot of your biggest pains that you have in life. And you might not realize where they come from, but, you know, the meal prep containers or the lunch boxes being a pain in the ass because they're so small. So <laughs> here's where I'll go with it. That is true. That is uh, a, yeah. a fact. Um, we're going to the purpose, though, and the pain in that. So I market specifically to women. Mm-hmm. Now, will that change over time? Sure. But going back to sales and marketing, it's like you can't you can't satisfy everybody, so you got to pick a lane and just go with okay. it. And for me, it's women who need an oversized lunch bag. Um, that's that's who I am. That's who my customer is now. Um, but I have expanded it past just a product. So many of the many, I think about the customer journey and people who are looking for an oversized lunch bag obviously care about their health. Yeah, they obviously work long days because they're gone and they need enough to pack for the day. Um, there's so many other things f- within that journey past the lunch bag. The, en- the lunch bag is kind of the end point, in my opinion. So now I have taken my experiences to help my customers throughout their entire journey with health and fitness, um, providing them a community of support around that and making better health choices for themselves and their family. Um, so I've... I, that has come directly from my experiences, though, and understanding their pain points on an emotional level of mm-hmm. what they're trying to where they're trying to be healthier. It's crazy because the pain points really true. Um, one of the things why we created our own apparel is because of the pain points of it. I was just telling him like I went and bought a few nice like nice shirts from Scottsdale, and I washed them once, and we hang dry our shirts. I've, okay. I know this. I hang dry them. I can't wear them no more. They're literally short. They're right up here. So it's now caused us, our pain points, to create our own apparel, add an extension of two to three inches yeah. on the bottom of all these yeah. shirts so that it can. And it's crazy because we only wear our shirts. Like, it's hard to wear anything else. And I go buy a couple. I just got reminded again. I buy a couple, wear it once, and not sit in my closet. And I can't wear it again. I got to hand it down to somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's so annoying well, and it sucks. And there's, a qual- there's been, <laughs> yeah. a, beyond the size, there's a quality issue with lunch bags. Mm-hmm. And they, even if you go to a larger sized one where there might be a few, um, the quality tends to be a very thin primary fabric. Um, and then the inner liners are just, they lack thickness and substance to the, the overall material where it's like, this just feels like, it feels like a shower curtain turned into a bag and it's just garbage. Right. Um, it doesn't <laughs> have lying. to be that way. So uh, there was a pain point there. Um, pro- so beyond the quality thing too, though, it's like, I don't know if you guys do this, but at least I have always done where you carry an oversized water bottle with you everywhere you go. Well, then it's like, okay, now I have to carry a lunch bag and this oversized water bottle and my keys and my phone. So, like, all the bags are designed to accommodate a large oversized water bottle. We have it. We offer it on our website. But if even if you don't have mine, like, I, when I designed all the bags, I made it to where it could fit a Hydro Flask or a Yeti or whatever your brand is so you're not, you know, pigeonholed into mine. But yeah. um, at least you can... Putting yes. everything in one central location. Everything in one bag, yeah. So let me ask you this. I want to dive into the back end of the business now because a lot of people don't understand when you're getting in and you're building a business, whether it's apparel, whether it's a product like you have. Mm-hmm. And not only that, when you're creating something, you're not robbing and duplicating anything. You're just recreating right. something that you believe is going to help your customers, your consumer base. And not only that, it helped you. So let's go through the, the pain points because somebody might be wanting to start their own business or going through it. But what is your experience in manufacturing products and did you just land on your first one and it go good? And how many times and how much money did you spend in sending it back, trying to find <laughs> it, and then going to this company, this company? I want to dive into that because yeah. people uh, understand like how if, how stressful and painful it yeah. can be and how much money it's, you could spend. If trying I to- had understood <laughs> all of it at the fro- at the way beginning, yep, I don't know that I would have ever gone down this whole rabbit hole of like manufacturing a product because it's not what I thought it would be. I'm at, I, you know, I'm like, I'm not at the end of it, but I've, I've learned so much along the way. Now I'm already in it, but it has been, um, how many manufacturers? Have I, so I started out Googling and then ultimately landed on Alibaba, which is like the marketplace for like your Amazon, China version of Amazon, but there's also all the manufacturers on there. Yeah. So I started out there, found, um, did like a request for proposal of like quotes of like, hey, this is my design. This is the material I want it made out of. Can you give me a quote? And at the time, I'm only trying to produce, 
well, low quantities, um, and I wanted a sample. So the first thing I learned is, like, you can send a design to six different manufacturers to get a sample to kind of see who you like to work with the best and who pr produces the best product. You can give them the same design, and you're going to get six very different yeah. samples back. Because every manufacturer interprets your drawing differently. Yes. Um, so there is a lot of back and forth um, to get a manufacturer to, to see the product the way you envision it in a tangible form. So you're trying to describe tangibly what this is supposed to look like because a 2D version on paper is still interpreted mm -hmm. a thousand different ways. So there's a lot of back and forth there. Um, you have to learn to be really crisp and clean with your communication too. I've found that like I've had to get really better with, with how to communicate something so that they can turn that into a product. But every sample that you receive, so if I get, I think in the beginning I started with three different manufacturers to test samples. You're paying for that. They'll probably do the sample for you for free, but you're paying the air freight from overseas to get that sample. So on average yep. that, you know, for a, a lunch bag size product, um, I would do DHL, you know, two day or whatever kind of air freight. It was like three hundred bucks on average. Um, so you now you're you're nine hundred dollars in to get three samples of the same thing. That's your first sample. You're gonna probably go back and forth on samples for at least three rounds. Yep. Um, so now <laughs> that's what eighteen hundred dollars. I mean, by that point, I think I had narrowed it down to a manufacturer. Like, okay, I'm gonna continue down this path with this one. Um, that's just the first go around. And then uh, you might work with that manufacturer. You're going to get the products going. You're going to say, hey, this is my first order. You're going to start selling the product where the next learning curve is. Um, and I don't know that everyone has this, but I, I, <sighs> I find it's actually not uncommon is the product, the original product that I produced didn't end up holding up very well over like after like six months. It was like 50% of them were doing great, 50% were like failing. And this yeah. is like the zippers were failing and other mm -hmm. things. So I am refunding, doing warranty claims, all yeah. of this. And then I'm like working with the manufacturer. I'm like, hey, this is holding up. So they sent me another round of some of the products just to kind of like make up for those ones. Well, those ones had a whole round of different issues with it. So I was like, okay, we, we didn't have this yeah. issue, but now I have another issue. Um, so then I just, over time, lost faith in that manufacturer, um, found another one, but you're not recouping the money of all that lost product, no, like that not. failed product. That's, you just keep moving you're, on. You're just, yeah. You, I mean, it's like people have asked, well, did you do any recourse? Like, well, I'm going to spend how much money on it? No, it's not worth yeah. the, the time and stress and money of doing that if there even is recourse. Um, so I had, I think, probably the most painful in some regards is I, I got, before I found a new manufacturer that I'm really happy with now, um, I ended up dumping the product that wasn't holding up. It was thousands of dollars of product that oh, yeah. went to the Glendale landfill. Yeah. And you have to, for IRS purposes, you have to photograph the fact that this product was disposed of and you're not continuing to sell it if it's, you know, uh, uh, defective. And... I remember as I took this photo, I'm just like dollar signs are like going. <laughs> I know how that feels. <laughs> but if you don't have that that tolerance of being able to handle something that painstaking and expensive, then entrepreneurship is not for you. Well, and I want to also dive into like how long did it take you from your first time finding your first manufacturer and getting your first one to getting your finished product to actually sell it? Yeah. So that was a um, over a year process. Yeah. See, and when and I started sketching, especially um, with bags. Yeah, I started sketching in like technically late 2018, 2018. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All of 2019, you know, the first six months were just back and forth, back and forth. And this is doing air freight. So you're able to expedite that process. Um, but it's at least you're a just, year. But you're just spending more money. And I'm glad that you're saying this because me and Michael have been through this with everything. We've done leather bags from duffel bags, backpacks, wallets. We've done books. Obviously, you see these like. And our first one started were plastic on the front, spiral brown, and I can see all the way to this. So what a lot of people don't understand, and for a lot of people that are that are listening to this right now, getting into business and when you want to manufacture a product, you need to know that one, you're going to have to go through and spend thousands of dollars to get to your finished product before you even sell your first product. Two, it's going to take six months to a year. 
a lot of people think that, man, like this book right here, hey, man, I want to make a few adjustments, this and that, and you think that you could just send it out and you're going to have the book back in one month. It, it's not going to happen. We're the bear of bad news. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so a couple of things, like just understanding the time that it's going to take for you to get your finished product, all the shit that you're going to go through, the money you're going to spend going back and forth from shipping and make sure that you add everything in because a lot of people will take, well, my manufacturer said it's going to cost this much, this much and everything for the book, but you also have to add in the shipping and handling cost, all that yeah, cost. And you need to find out <laughs> packaging, all of it. And then if you yeah. add pins to it, even like this little tassel on it, like you have to add all these costs in. So a lot of people will take just the basic cost and then they say, all right, well, here's going to be my retail cost. And then it gets all the way to them and then they start selling them and then they're finding out that there's no cash flow and that's they actually didn't overturning account it. Oftentimes too, I mean, I, I fortunately had done enough research to be aware of this in advance, but I can see where many people don't think about it is the cost of fr your final product. So depending upon the quantity or so I order at a quantity that air freight is no longer an option because yeah. it would just be astronomical. So I have to do, uh, I do shipment by sea mm -hmm. and then that's a whole nother learning curve of finding a freight shipper yeah. to get that product from, you know, whatever overseas country you're working with all the way across the ocean to then say land in California. And then now you got to get a truck from California to Arizona. Like there's, there's so many logistical pieces past designing and getting yeah. the final product. So there's another round of costs. Um, well, and we learned all that going into it. And that's one of the lessons we learned. And I sat with my business partner and I'm like, well, here's the cost. And I was like, here's the cost to make this and get it all done. He's all, but the only thing I'm not seeing in here is I don't see your shipping costs. I don't see your pens costs. I don't see this cost. And I'm all, oh, shit. He's all, yeah, bro. That's all finished product. You have to add all that in. And when it gets to you, what you do is you add everything in. And when it gets to your, your home, your warehouse, wherever it is, you add all that up and you find out what it took for each one of those products. If you order 50 of them, add all that. your shipping, everything you've done, designing, yeah. and now take it and then divide it by 50. And that's what it costs you to get each book there. And now you could be able to take that and find out what is going to be your retail price so that you can make a profit on it <laughs> so you can turn it back right. into your business. It's so crazy. So There's so many pieces to it. Um, and I, I feel like I still have so much to learn. But even what I do know, it's like when you when someone starts asking you questions about something and they and they don't know, it's like oh I, I I think we take for granted how much we've learned along the way, even though we still have a long yeah. way to go. Um, yeah. But well, yeah, yeah, we've had people get mad at us. Like they're like, hey man, I want to start my own clothing brand. We get them in here, it's like cool, and then it's like all right, sweet, and they want to sample it. And I'm like, all right, man, well your first sample is going to take four to six weeks, and then not only that, it's going to be two hundred fifty bucks, maybe three hundred. Like what the fuck? And I'm all I'm like, yes, they're all just that's just a sample, and I'm all yeah, bro, and they're all. Well, 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 why? And then we break it down and we'll show them because we have nothing. I'm yeah. like, dude, we're not making money off of you getting a sample. Like, <laughs> let me show you how all this works. You got to pay a designer once you get this done. Then we send it over. Then it's, yeah, people just don't and they understand. don't. You know, one thing I one thing I learned in the process with my <laughs> own mac manufacturers is the pattern cutting. Yeah. I, I'm thinking, yo, here's a drawing of my design. You're going to make a bag. Well, there is a whole design team <laughs> yeah. on the manufacturing end <laughs> that is now taking that and turning it into a pattern to cut because if they go to scale and you are starting to produce hundreds or thousands of bags, yeah. they need something that they're cutting all the material from. Um, so there's just all those little pieces that you just don't know about. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned in physical products is never launch marketing that you're going to release stuff just because it's oh, shipping no. yeah, or pre-shipping exactly. or we were, we, we were launching, honestly, these books, these two books, bottom ones right here, the daily financial book and the daily goal book, they were sitting on the LA dock for two months before they even got off the boat. And we, we had the launch date for whenever they slanted at mm -hmm. the dock and then the hold up during uh, the 2020, 2021 schedule, like, it, they just kept the boats there forever. And yeah, we were like, told from them, like, I'm hey, sending man. emails out, like, all right, yeah. guys, boats. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't for that reason. It's yeah. like when, um, even when I was revamping the entire product line and getting rid of all the original stuff from the original manufacturer, I didn't put anything out. It's like maybe I should have done some pre sales on it, but it was like, I don't know when I'm getting this. Let me just. You know, I had final samples to do photography and stuff on, but I didn't put anything out about when it was going to come. Mm -hmm. um, just got launched. What do you What do you do right now in business or with uh, just business, business relationships? What are you doing right now to keep yourself consistent and keep yourself scaling? And so, I have a business coach um, to keep myself expanding as far as what I don't know, mm -hmm. learning what I don't know. Um, so. Uh, 
I've been in different masterminds and I'm in Arate, which is like a business group. Um, yep. But I would, and I've learned a lot within that group, but where I really, really have learned is in the last few months, I work now with a business coach who is specific in e-commerce. Like that's, he's done amazing there. Um, and I meet with, uh, I have one-on-one -on -one calls with him every other week and then we do group calls three times a week. So that is almost every day of the week. And that keeps me focused on uh, where I'm trying to go with the brand and scaling and implementing what I don't know to continue to get better at it. So yeah. When you uh, focus more on the larger bags and you, you transition to that, how has it been in scaling your business since you've done that and everything? And has it's, it has it been more successful yeah, for you? Yeah, it's and been more successful because now I can be more specific in my ads and my marketing um, and who my customer is instead of trying to... Um, you know, you have two different customers. If you have a small bag and a large bag, from a consumer standpoint, that's two very different customers. And then you're all over the place trying to market. Yeah. And then even your even your copy, your words on your website, it's like, okay, am I am I this or am I that? Like, you can't be specific. So, it has allowed me to really just be hyper focused on this one kind of customer avatar, um, which has actually alleviated stress because now I'm not trying to pull my hair out to figure out how to reach different customers and. Yeah create more confusion ultimately. Um, and on that though, you have to be willing to stay in your, stay hyper-focused. So I'll still periodically get emails or direct messages on online from, from different women like, oh, I really love your designs, but do you have a small one? Can you make a small one? And I, that was a mistake I made early on. I would be like, oh yeah, I can do that. And I would go make something based upon one customer, one yeah. potential customer asking for it. Um, and then it was like, well, now I'm, now I'm all over the place. So when I made that, that shift and that focus to be just large, I have to remind myself like, nope, this is my lane. This is where I'm staying for now. You know, will it be that way forever? But I'm not, um, you can't just keep trying to go to the next shiny object because someone's asking for it. You got to stay hyper, hyper focused. Yeah, I think that's huge because that's one yeah. of the things that me and Michael ran into and it's really hard because you do and and you, and your customers will will can also like kind of they can get you distracted and get oh, yeah. you a squirrel like oh man yes and because someone brought you this great idea or they told you this might be your mind starts to go down that hole so now you're sitting here trying to do all these things when you're like hey man i need to focus here and i know with us one of our things is it's like we want to focus on a big this big of a niche when we need to really focus here starting in this niche same once we execute and win here then we can open up to more niches and then go from there and so. that's my <laughs> and that's my plan with the brand it's like until i until i have dug as deep as I can go. You know, I'm an inch yeah. wide. My focus is an inch wide, a mile deep. When I hit a mile deep, assuming that's the full depth, when, once I'm a mile deep, then we can go two inches wide and three inches wide and, and can you continue to expand, you know, into different sized insulated bags to, to men's ones, to children's regular school lunch bags. Like, you know, we can do all of that, but I'm not going to do all of that now because we talked about just getting samples. It's like, okay, I'm going to do samples in this process of sampling and air freight to test every sample for 12 more different lines. Like it just financially, it, would, it doesn't make sense. You know, One thing not, I until noticed you get to a, a scale mm -hmm. of a multi-million dollar corporation. Exactly. It's just, and even then they have to be careful with it. You know? Yeah. You're tr One you're thing I've seen uh, published out was Louis Vuitton and all these bigger brands and stuff. They work on fashion. You see them drop light fashion products, but what they do is, they're so far ahead that they know exactly what they're dropping 12 years from now, what exact design it looks like and how much quantity they're going to produce in 12 years. That's how far ahead That's in insane. designing that they are. Yeah. But I've allowed myself to be able to design like that now in, in business is like, okay, I could design these things, but they're just designs. Mm -hmm. And now they get put on the shelf. Maybe you can even start sampling slowly. I've, but, I'm, I'm doing the same thing yeah. um, with some new designs. It's like I can't tell you if they'll ever be launched or when they'll be launched, but I've always kind of got things in my head percolating as far as what the next ones will be. But, um, yeah, you have to – you definitely have to to tame the squirrel. You know? Yeah, you do. It's a lot, and it's hard. In today's world, it's even hard because you got social media. You get on there, and you're like, man, damn, that looks good. I should add that to – not no, stick no. that. No, yeah, <laughs> I – and that's even with colors. Like, I – there was one, the one time I got onto this whole, like, oh, what's the trending color? Hit me in the ass. Don't, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. don't, don't do that, Sarah. Like, just, um, and the other thing, too, is, like, follow your, 
your gut on what you want to do. Don't look at what anyone else is doing. Correct. Because yeah. that just sets you down. They're already ahead of you because they started it before you did. But now you're just like everybody else. And I found myself doing that originally with uh, some of my original, um, just even like social media marketing and things, you know, originally in 2020, it was like, I was kind of looking at like, well, what are, what are the other, what are the other ones doing? No, no, no. We got checked on that. I got to tell him. Yeah. yeah, You want to tell her that? Dude, we got checked on that. And it was like, that was our first thing. And I'll be honest with you, we don't really like now look at any other companies or anybody anymore. It's like, we just get in and whatever me and him, our thoughts and what our gut tells us and what we create, we go with it. We sample it. We put it out there. And then we see, we see how our customer does, but we don't, we used to, Hey, let's look, we get all this stuff and then look at everybody's stuff. And then it just creates more confusion in your own mind too. Um, And even where I, where I have pivoted to is even from a, Social media, Instagram, you know, you can have all these fancy de- designs on your grid of like, okay, it's going to be perfectly laid out. I've just decided, you know what, fuck it. I don't care what anyone else's, how their grid is laid out, if it's like a carousel to a reel to a stat, like I'm just going to post what I want to post because I like to post it. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to post, I'll post even like customers' information, like their their own personal health journey. It's like, okay, is this related to a lunch bag? No, but or it's related to the lifestyle. Um, you know, another silly example is like on my stories with the, the customers, it's like I had posted a photo of me as the founder with my dog. And I was like, hey, if you guys didn't know, Contivo has an unofficial mascot. And I named the dog my dog. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I put the little question box. I'm like, hey, share pictures of your dog. And a bunch of customers start like That's awesome. sharing nice. pictures of their dog. So then I'm like sharing all of their photos and I was like, hey, what do lunch bags and our customers' dogs have in common? I was like, nothing, nothing at all. I'm like, but we don't do anything like everybody else, so we're going to share it because that's what makes us smile. That got the most interaction of anything ever on the business page. It's crazy. But that was me willing yeah. to say, you know what? Fuck what other people are putting on their story where it's just business and just the do product and want. just this. It's like our, our customer is the lifeblood of the brand. And if they like dogs and they want to share pictures of their dogs, that's going on our stories oh, yeah. for the brand. I don't care that we sell lunch bags. And that was me just really living our one of our core values, which is like original and unafraid of being different. It's like, no, I'm going to be original, unafraid of being different. And who cares? You know? made you who I was are. on a phone call back to uh, sharing that story too. And I have strategic partners that I call for specific things. So one of my strategic partners is from the FUBU brand. If you remember the yeah. FUBU brand, yeah, uh, J. Alexander Martin. And I had reached out to the, him originally because I went FUBU growing up was the only brand, like one of those Walmart brands that I can only afford. Okay. Now they shifted over to a premium brand. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. We're trying to shift in to be this high level premium brand. Let me see if I could get some advice. And so... We hop on a call and I start telling him how we're launching, what we're doing, and Nike's doing it this way. I'm thinking we're going to do this. He goes, he goes, stop, stop, stop right there. That's your problem. I was like, what do you mean? He, he goes, well, the thing is, is Nike's a 7,500-year-old company. The way they launched is not the same way you're going to launch today with all this tech, with all this new stuff. So you got to stop just thinking about everybody else and what they did and what they're doing and just do it your own way based on all the lessons that were set in place before you. You know, and here's um, something, I don't remember where I heard this, but it's like, oh, Alex Hermosi. Yeah. Don't look at what other brands are doing because they're all broke. Mm-hmm. So why are you gonna wanna copy them and duplicate them? And once I really got into to understand, now that I understand what I understand, whether it's about consumer behavior, online marketing, making a product, when I look at these other competitor brands that might have 50 or 100,000, you know, whatever followers. And I look at their engagement rate. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, you are fucking broke. Because you might have, you know, 50,000 followers, but I see your post and you got 10 likes and all your 10 likes are from your brand ambassadors. Where are your customers chiming in here? Yeah. I have like 1,600 followers, but my engagement rate is like 33% on my on my followers i would rather take that smaller engagement but just really really consumers or customers that are bought into the brand than thousands of thou- thousands and thousands of followers and not a single customer can be seen on your post commenting yep 
No, that's powerful. Where, the where's the long term? To me, where, where's the long term sustainability of that? Right. And that's also fluff. That to me is just like you're. It's more show than it is um, substance. So, what's something it. you've done with Contivo to build that community base? I provide value. I, I don't try to sell the product. I'm not here to push you into buying it. I'm gonna, if you if you land on my Instagram page, I'm going to provide you value. Period. Mm-hmm. I'm going to send you a DM. I'm going to ask you, hey, do you need health and fitness lifestyle advice? Because going back to the customer journey, I have expertise there. If you land here, you're showing some level of support by just following the page. Right. And I'm going to provide you value back. So I, I'll send video messages. I'll send personal, you know, I try to do a video message. Sometimes it's a typed message um, with a new follower and say, hey, thanks for following. If you need any free health and fitness advice, um, hit me up. That's where, you know, I like to provide value. And um, people are shocked by that because they're like, whoa, she's not even trying to sell me on her bags and she's willing to give me free advice. Yep. And that's where the, that community starts to get built from there. Um, the sales that have come in from that as a byproduct unintentionally has been better than any paid marketing I've ever done. And the, the beauty of it is I really like building these relationships with them. So it's not even, right. this isn't inauthentic. I love the Does relationships like that are being built. You. Yeah, I think that's where it's most important. You got to be able to enjoy your customers. I mean, yeah. they're, they're the ones giving you the money. So People you go be into, to... I think a lot of entrepreneurs go into running a business with the, what can I sell you and how much money can I make? And that's the, that's the backwards approach. It, it should be, how can I provide you value? How can we build a community and a relationship around whatever our little market is? And let the sales happen as a byproduct of that. Customers aren't going to buy from you if they don't trust you. I mean, we got to think about how we are. You know, for most things, um, I'm going to buy from those that I like and trust. And a a $40 object is no different. It's all sales is a people's business. Yeah. 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 And that is where we are losing it more and more. I I think it's easier to, I now think it's easier to have a competitive advantage because it's gotten so technological based that everyone's just trying to have everything be automated and there's no personal aspect of anything anymore. Um, and people aren't willing to give their time for free. I think that's another thing of why right. it's losing that. Cause everyone is so like, yeah, you have to make money at a point, but you have to have to have that, that human element and relationship, build relationships and provide value. And a lot of people can't look, past the immediate desire for profit to Mm -hmm. to build relationships i believe that i think that's where they're missing the mark to uh close it off i have a question also an announcement guys because uh sarah is the first female on the millionaires to billionaires podcast (laughs) show so i don't know if you guys have been aware of that and watched all of our episodes but man i was like how are we gonna get a female onto the show and when but um, with that exciting news, that you know, awesome. what uh, what advice and stuff could you give to other women entrepreneurs in, you know, part of their journeys and stuff to keep them going? Be willing to pivot and adapt mm-hmm. and don't get so hard set on to, you know, you have an idea and a vision and you might draw that out and map that out. Um, don't let any kind of stubbornness keep you set on that being your only path. Pivot and adapt along the way constantly. Like you're gonna probably constantly be pivoting and adapting. And you Mm -hmm. can keep with the same vision. Like it doesn't mean that the vision has to change, but how you're gonna get to that vision is probably going to change. But you have to be willing to go into it with the mindset that you know you're you're not gonna necessarily stay stuck on one thing Mm -hmm. um, and be willing to to pivot. Yeah, and I agree with you. We've uh, for the last four years, we've had to pivot, pivot, pivot. But our vision and, and, our, and our vision is clear, vision. and it's never in changed. In fact, I think the vision gets more clear. Um, it gets more <laughs> yeah, clear yeah. along the way, and it probably is going to even grow. Um, but it's going to always be a variation of the original vision. But what will constantly change is how you get there, and yes. don't quit on it because yeah. it's like you're going to hit so many roadblocks along the way. And if you let the first thing or the second thing or the third thing like stop you from it don't don't even go into it um yeah. it's like you just understand that that's a part of the process and a part of the journey is it's just gonna be it is 
and every roadblock might get a little bit, it might feel harder than the one before, but you have to then understand like that one before equipped you to now get past this next one yeah. and the next one. I think what's nice to know is that there's 8 billion people in this world and there's very minimal of us that are entrepreneurs that are actually d building products to sell the 8 billion people. When people hit these roadblocks, just know that people will give up at the eighth roadblocks, ninth roadblock, 10th roadblock. And all you have to do is hit the next one and keep going and hit the next one and keep going. And ultimately one more extra day in business, you know, longer than that other person, you're going to be that bigger brand. And, and understand that every single brand or product based, brand, I, I, I have a bigger passion for product based brands, but it's like mm -hmm. every one of them, it has gone through what you're experiencing and more. Yeah. Yes. So that's why you just have to keep going. Um, that'd be my that'd be my top advice. Pivot and adapt. Absolutely. And and not be afraid to hit the reset button. Yeah. So it's like if sure. you're getting ready to quit or you're getting ready to like throw in the towel, before you do that, reset. Yes. Reset. I totally agree with you. And go back. Um, mm -hmm. If you need to reset for an hour, a day, a week, a month, whatever, just don't throw in the towel. Um, and reach and not be afraid to ask for help from those who have done it before you. Not just anyone, but like who has really, who has done what you're trying to do um, yep. and get help. And you might have to pay for that help. But that's just part of it. You know, I think people um, want everything for free in that journey or think they're going to find it on YouTube. And it's like sometimes you're going to actually have to pay for a good coach to help you. But that's part of it. And don't be afraid to make that investment as well. Yep. Sweet. Great way to end it off, guys, because that's an amazing advice. Um, again, having her on as the first, you know, <laughs> female onto the show, that's been a great experience, great conversation. If you guys found value, all we ask is that you guys share the value with friends, with family, invite them to the show to watch and listen, and, you know, leave some comments. We comment back, we engage back with everything we see, and we want to see you guys on the next episode. So thank you guys for tuning in.